everyone. Welcome back to the In The Lab stage. Sorry for that little delay. The joys of uh, using technology for these uh, big virtual conferences. Really appreciate you sticking with us and being here for our Spotlight Talks, which we're just about to dive straight into. Little note, um, I don't know if you saw the lightning talk that would have been shown in the break uh, in between uh, the sessions. They're going to be in, ver in between various different sessions, but if you miss them, you can go back and watch them in the on-demand section and hop in. This is all about showcasing innovative piece of Turing Institute research in action. Um, let's go into our next session and we're going to be doing spotlight talks. We've got three amazing researchers who are going to be uh, showcasing or showing you their uh, their research that they've been doing. After each of the presentations, we'll do a little bit of Q&A. So again, use Slido, send in your questions and I'll make sure I can put it to each of the researchers. Without further ado, here is our first researcher, Dustin Carlino, Research Associate at the Alan Turing Institute. Take it away, Dustin. Hello, I'm Dustin Carlino. Great to be here today. Uh, this is a talk about designing low traffic neighborhoods using software. So uh, the motivation for low traffic neighborhoods and many other uh, current planning interventions are to reduce motor vehicle dependency in, in cities. Uh, too many cars in cities cause a number of externalities. And so uh, this is a problem that people are very interested in, in fixing for many reasons. Um, and in particular, uh, in the UK, over the last uh, couple of decades, the amount of traffic on small residential roads has really uh, increased a fair bit. And so um, this is partly due to increased congestion uh, along main roads, and then partly due to the ability for people to use uh, sat-nav and find shortcuts when, when there are traffic jams. Uh, so to solve these problems, one common technique planners use are, are called modal filters, where um, some temporary barriers are placed in, in a street that allow people to uh, walk, bike, and, um, uh, and like take scooters through, but you can't drive through it. And so you would, of course, expect uh, these filters to like, uh, calm the, the amount of traffic on a street um, in that one area. But if you're able to, uh, to place a few of these, you can sort of strategically um, create, a, create an effect uh, called a low traffic neighborhood where there's no reason to, to sort of drive through a whole area. Um, and the uh, so during the pandemic, a fair number of these were, uh, were, were rolled out due to the Active Travel Fund. And um, in short, the, the public response has been mixed. There's been a lot of uh, very positive feedback from people who felt more comfortable walking and biking in the area, but also uh, a fair bit of pushback from people that thought the, the consultation around, these, around planning these was, uh, was done too, too quickly. And so um, I think a lot of the problem is about miscommunication. So once these things are sort of designed, uh, they're communicated out to the public using these diagrams that are um, pretty easy to understand. They show you where you are uh, able to get into different parts of the neighborhood um, and, and show the fact that you're not able to, uh, to drive through it anymore um, to take a shortcut. Instead, you're supposed to use the main roads. Um, but during the, like a, a common bit of feedback is that there's not enough consultation. And so uh, one way to engage the public more is to hold live workshops uh, get everybody in a community in a room and just like design where these should go in person. Um, and currently, the, the sort of state of the art for doing that live, we can't have those nice diagrams. We just have to uh, sort of draw lines over uh, CAD software or, or satellite imagery. Um, and and uh, neither the diagram nor the sort of uh, drawing over the satellite really tells people what they want to know, which is um, somebody you know takes a driving trip today and they want to know how does this affect my trip. Um, you know, they're used to map interfaces like uh, Google and Apple that let them, let them plan journeys around detours, but there's not currently a way to, uh, to do the same thing when proposing a new LTN. Um, and so now uh, I'm going to show a video demo of uh, some new software that, um, that helps solve this problem. So uh, this, is, uh, this is some new software that uh, lets you plan LTNs a little bit better. So we're going to first uh, focus on this area in Manchester, covered or uh, drawn in yellow. And so this is similar to the, the diagrams before, where um, each colored cell is showing the, the way uh, that it's possible or not possible to, um, to drive between different areas. And so for example, you can't drive between the yellow and the blue, uh, or between the blue and the purple, unless you leave and use the main road. Um, there's no through traffic sort of permitted between these. But you'll note at the uh, sort of the top of this neighborhood, um, this yellow cell is, is massive, and so there's sort of a lot of ways to, uh, to drive through from east to west, and the different uh, shades of red are kind of showing that. And so we can explore some different interventions that'll help. If we zoom in on a road, we can place one of those new modal filters in the middle, um, and it sort of has that immediate traffic calming effect there, uh, moving traffic around. But you'll notice that the, the red just sort of moved a little bit to the south. Like if you put a filter there, people will just drive a bit more south. 
Um, and so we can sort of uh, play whack-a-mole and, and try to solve this problem with a, a few filters and eventually um, get the effect that we want where uh, you know, if you have enough filters, then we can split the yellow area into two pieces. Now it's not possible to drive through east to west. Um, and so this sort of achieves the de desired effect, but in fact, we don't need this many filters. Um, if you look closely, uh, we can actually do the same thing with just one filter placed a little bit, little bit farther over. So the software also gives you a way to, to draw a lot of filters very quickly. Uh, we can just draw a line across and, um, and split that area. And then uh, it turns out with only four filters, we can take this entire neighborhood and, and pretty much remove all reasons to, uh, to drive through it um, to cut across. So thinking a little bit more about how the, um, this like predicted rat run or shortcutting happens, uh, we can look at individual paths that cut across the neighborhood. And so there's, there's a lot of example, examples of these that run from east to west. And we can just sort of browse through, um, and residents in a room can sort of talk about the ones that are, that are problems for them. And uh, once we have a particular rat run that we care about, we can do the same thing where we place filters and see how uh, that particular shortcut sort of responds to the changes. And then um, you know, maybe it goes away once we've sort of solved that problem. Uh, so this has sort of been the view from the, the planning perspective. But um, it's very important to let residents know uh, how the changes will affect their trips. And so once we sort of design uh, an LTN proposal, we can give people a, a Google Maps-like interface where, uh, say, somebody wants to drive from, uh, from A to B. They can, see, um, they can see what their route looks like. And you'll notice that the, the route actually um, takes the main roads by default. So uh, that's actually fastest if, uh, you know, in sort of normal conditions. But um, of course, normal conditions aren't always the case. And so if there is high levels of congestion, uh, there's a setting to sort of simulate that. And now it's possible to see that um, under high condition or under uh, heavy traffic conditions, it, it becomes advantageous to cut through the neighborhood using the blue route. But of course, since we've placed the filter uh, interrupting that route, then now people are, are still um, supposed to use the uh, the main the main road shown in red, um, sort of as intended. And uh, next, I'll show you. We'll, we'll move to a different map in uh, North Leeds, and I'll show you how to adjust the boundaries of uh, of the neighborhoods that are um, shown in the software. So let, let's say that this uh, this yellow area. Um, isn't, isn't large enough of a, of a neighborhood, and we want to also apply traffic calming um, farther to the, uh, to the east. So we can sort of select block by block and expand the boundary, or we can um, highlight a lot of it quickly. And so once we sort of expand that boundary, uh, we can place filters through the, um, through the middle of this neighborhood, now, now treating that main road uh, north-south as part of the neighborhood and sort of redefining what we want um, to have access, uh, or, or what road should be through traffic and which one should be access only. Um, and finally, I'll show you a way to compare multiple proposals. So uh, if you're designing a new LTN, uh, residents are going to have a lot of ideas for variations and, and different things they want to see. And so you can load multiple, pro multiple proposals at the same time and just quickly uh, flip through them and, and see the different effects um, of, of the rest of, the, uh, of, of what the software shows you. And similarly, we can um, see how each of these proposals will affect routes planned. So if uh, somebody wants to drive from north to south, um, they can just quickly see how the proposal will affect their, uh, their routes in all cases. So uh, that's it for the, for the demo. Um, returning, to, uh, returning to the slides. Um, so uh, a little bit more about this software. You can use it today by going to ltn.abstreet.org. It runs directly in your web browser. Um, and uh, you can also install it locally. And if you, if you run it locally, it, it runs a lot faster than the web browser, so I do recommend that. Um, the project is completely open source uh, and free to use for everybody. There's no, there's no barriers. Um, and it's very, meant, very much meant for everyone to use it. So uh, this definitely should get a lot of use by people actually in charge of designing LTNs. But the goal is for, uh, for individuals and campaign groups that are, want to be more engaged with this process to use it too. And so by having everybody use the same software, um, communication can sort of be improved. So this tool works anywhere in the world thanks to a project called OpenStreetMap. But of course, um, LTNs are sort of an only, uh, are most appropriate for, for designing in cities. Uh, and a little bit about how the project was built. Um, I'm the main person responsible, responsible but uh, about a month ago, a UX designer from Seattle named Cindy Huang joined. Um, and then along the way, a bunch of other people have uh, given great feedback um, and sort of inspired the what this tool should even do in the first place. And so thanks to all of them for, uh, for their involvement. Um, and this software is built on a larger project called AB Street that I've been working on for a few years with a few other people, uh, Michael Kirk and Yuen Lee, who are no longer on the project, but their efforts very much went uh, towards building this today. So uh, now I'm going to really quickly describe how the software works. Um, of course, I don't have time. So if you're interested, join the workshop at 3 uh, tomorrow to get more details. 
So to start with, we have to define what a neighborhood is. Um, in short, it's, it's two pieces. We, we draw the perimeter roads uh, around the edge of it, and the sort of intention that these are major roads that are explicitly designed to handle uh, traffic going long distances, but in the, interior, in, in the interior of the neighborhood, we don't want a lot of traffic cutting through. And so once we define a neighborhood, um, we, we break it into these different cells uh, shown in different colors, and the idea of a cell is that you can drive from anywhere within the cell to anywhere else without leaving and using the perimeter road. Um, and so, for example, here it's impossible to drive between the purple and the blue parts without using the, the main road at the bottom. Um, of course, if you place uh, filters incorrectly, you can just sort of disconnect a section of the, of the neighborhood in the middle, uh, and the software will, will tell you if you make that mistake. Um, and a little bit of the computer science behind how to calculate these, uh, we'll go into more details tomorrow, but in short, um, you don't need to have a, a technical uh, background to understand this. It's a very visual process that I think is satisfying to learn about, so please do join tomorrow uh, if you can. Um, moving on to the prediction about uh, traffic cutting through the middle of the neighborhood, um, why are some of these streets uh, not colored red at all? In short, it's because there's no, um, there's no reason for a driver to go there in order to, uh, to get through the neighborhood. It's only useful um, to do so if, uh, sorry, it's only useful to do so if, uh, apologies, yeah, it's, it's only uh, useful to, uh, to take the, the roads in red in order to cut across the neighborhood. If you're going to um, a house in the middle of the neighborhood and, and delivering there, then uh, that's the only traffic those roads are likely to see. So this is a particular uh, shortcut through the, through the neighborhood, and the way these are defined um, have a, a few tricks that I'll get into in the workshop later. Uh, but I'll, I'll note that this sort of isn't the bigger picture. We, we need to have more information to know how many people are even likely to take the shortcut through a neighborhood. Um, and so this view is only meant to focus on one neighborhood at a time. So next I want to talk about how to define a neighborhood. These different colors are uh, what the software treats as different neighborhoods, and they, don't, they may not correspond to, um, to a local definition. So in short, it's finding roads that are classified as, as major uh, in some way, usually A and B roads, and then tracing the area in between. So, um, it's important to note that this process will cross railroads and uh, water and other natural boundaries. Um, and this is sort of a default assumption of the software, but uh, this is something that can very much be adjusted. Um, and it is an important conversation to, to make that, uh, or, like humans very much have to, uh, to be involved in this process to um, set the boundaries properly. Um, so uh, for example, we can take the, the blue neighborhood boundary um, and adjust block by block to get uh, a larger shape like that. Um, so uh, the software also has a, it can, can help you uh, decide where to place filters. I don't recommend um, trusting this blindly, but it, it can be a useful tool. So imagine you have a budget of exactly one filter to help this neighborhood. Where would you place it? Um, if you try to pick the road that has the most uh, traffic along it right now, it doesn't really help. It'll just sort of move the problem over, um, over a road usually. Uh, but we can try some other techniques based on um, the computer science thing called minimum cut of the graph that kind of tries to, uh, to disconnect the graph into two pieces and, and maximize the size of the two resulting pieces. And in this case, it, it works quite well. Um, and so the, those tools are additionally there uh, for inspiration. So um, the LTN software is available for use today, uh, and I, I want people to use it. But of course, there are many, uh, many next steps, in, in particular being able to take the proposals you've drawn and upload them online. Um, and share them out. And I'm also working on training material uh, and a bunch of other popular requests or uh, feature requests that I've heard a lot of times. Um, but uh, e even sort of despite the, the prototype status of the software, a few different groups are, uh, are already using it. So if you want to join this list, um, please email me. I can help import your city if it's not already there. Uh, if you happen to have travel demand data, um, we can also get that in. And uh, I'm very much looking for, uh, for help from other people to work on this. Very few, uh, yeah, very, very few resources went into building it. And I, um, I also want to know what, what else the software should, uh, should, should sort of do. Um, and I'll mention that uh, LTNs are not the, the only intervention that we need in cities. So in particular, uh, they may push a lot of, um, they may, they may pu push a lot of road to, uh, they may push a lot of traffic to perimeter roads. And so it's important to design safe crossings and other interventions there to, uh, to make those change, to facilitate those, facilitate those changes. Um, and some prior work in the rest of the AB Street project can help uh, design road space reall reallocation and things like that. And so please get in touch if you want to, um, to learn anything about it. Thank you.
Thank you so much. Um, that was absolutely fascinating. What an interesting tool. Come, come join me. Um, we've already got questions in from the audience. Uh, probably here is the best one for you. Yeah, yeah. Come, on, come closer. Um, so if anyone's got any questions, please do chuck them in. Slide over right now and I will um, put them to Dustin and see if we can get as many as possible. First question, which I think probably is on most people's um, lips, which you started to touch on a little bit when you were talking about making sure there were safe crossings and whatnot, um, is of course about putting more cars into those perimeter roads. Um, Prithi, um, Prithvi asks, won't this increase congestion on the main roads significantly at peak times? Um, so this is a question that's being studied a fair bit. In the short term, it's probably the case, but the, the goal of LTNs is to encourage more people to walk and cycle uh, or take public transit. Like the, the number of driving trips needs to go down overall. Yeah. Um, LTNs are one technique to push towards that, but it's not the only technique. You have to make other changes. Okay, so it's yeah. a sort of a short-term problem, hopefully for a long-term solution, I guess, in, in terms of that pushing to the congestion. Right, and there have to be other interventions made along perimeter roads to, to keep going. Like LTNs are, are just sort of step one in that regard. Amazing. Um, next question is from Anonymous. Um, are there any ambitions to provide automated suggestions of LTN placements based on traffic flow analysis? Um, yes, I, I briefly showed a little bit of that at the per neighborhood level. Uh, if we have good measurements of, um, of which roads have a lot of traffic, then I think there's some, some techniques we could try out. But it's important to always keep humans in the loop. Um, you know, the people know, know their space better, and so the, the software can provide ideas but not, you know, design things for people. But it's just a, a new tool to, to use with it. Amazing. Um, an another question here from Nick Lockett. How do you model the capacity of main roads? Do the models have the capability of determining flow in light of barriers, i.e. timing of traffic lights and buses? Um, there's other traffic simulation software that works on that. This, uh, this LTN tool doesn't really work with that, but that could be a future direction that we look to integrate with other, other models. And, and one question from myself, how you talked about these other interventions and how does these, these sort of technologies integrate with things like city planning and the people that are making decisions around how to actually manage the traffic as a whole and, and as you say, trying to get people to make less journeys and so on and so forth. What's your sort of ambition in terms of making sure it plugs into those bigger discussions? I mean, uh, the larger AB Street project is meant to redesign cities at a larger scale um, to encourage more walking and cycling and public transit. Uh, it's still a little bit up, up, uh, up for debate exactly how the LTNs fit in with that. At the moment, um, the software is just meant to plan one particular thing, and um, yeah, and we'll keep exploring how to how to help planners see the, the bigger picture. Okay. Um, one final. Oh, there's now lots of questions coming in. Another uh, comment here from David Nixon. The consultation issue is key. Um, Oxford has just had a major row about introducing these areas. Um, you know, this might help. He's, he's saying, are you looking to for I guess. Um, examples of where these sort of things are happening in real real time to see how actually making these interventions is going to impact well society, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the software is running, uh, or the LTN software is running in about uh, ten different places today, based on people who've gotten in touch. But if you are uh, involved with a local planner or uh, a campaigning group, or you're just interested, then please get in touch, and we can import that area and, and start to study the the things that are happening on the ground with it. Amazing. Um, Probably time for one, one or two final questions. A um, question from when she can it instruct an ambulance to cross neighborhoods directly in an emergency? Um, I think the software probably isn't meant for that. Uh, but as long as the, the location of the, fil uh, the filters are known to whatever routing app they use, then um, ambulances can, can find a way around. Yeah, yeah. As opposed to just be plugging into whatever is being used uh, today, it's you know, updating traffic systems, right? If you're going to put in these. Um... Right. OK. Um, one final question then uh, from David, which I think builds on this point that I was um, saying earlier in terms of how do you actually plug in to these wider wider points. David's saying, what, what is your long-term aim? Um, reduce traffic in areas or reduce traffic for traffic overall? How would the latter happen? I mean, what, what do you, what's your sort of vision in terms of how we get cars, uh, less cars on the road and so on and so forth? Um, I don't know that I have a comprehens comprehensive vision for it, but I guess the, the thing that I want to see is uh, to get the public more engaged with this process. And so... Uh, the AB Street project sort of started as a vision of um, getting people who are interested in computer games like SimCity more involved in the transporta transportation planning process. Uh, and so more broadly, I'd, li I'd like a way to, to use all of the technology being developed uh, to get it in the hands of the people so they can understand the changes being made and, um, and be, be more engaged with the process. Amazing. Dustin, thank you so much for joining us and for taking us through all of your work. Absolutely fascinating. We're going to move on to our next presentation, which is going to be virtual, and we're going to be welcoming Professor Morella Lapata, who's from the University of Edinburgh. Here, Morella is on standby, ready to present. Morella, over to you.
Okay, thank you. So should I start speaking? Okay, okay. Uh, hello, good morning, everyone. Uh, so now we're gonna switch to a completely different topic. Uh, so the title of my talk is Movie Summarization as a Testbed for mach Machine Reasoning. And let me tell you a little bit about what machine reasoning is. These are my collaborators, uh, just to show you that Research does not happen in a vacuum, but there's usually a team effort and there's a lot of people, PhD students, postdocs, other faculty people, they're all at the University of Edinburgh or have been at some point. Okay, so what is reasoning? The title of the talk. Um, so if you look um, up a textbook, you will see that the textbook definition of reasoning is the following, uh, taking pieces of information, combining them together and using these to draw logical conclusions or devise new information. And I want you to notice three things in this definition. First of all, we are taking pieces of information. So this means that we integrating or we're taking into account knowledge from different sources. We are combining them. Uh, so uh, emphasis again, we will have different knowledge from different experiences in our lifetime and we will integrate them and into something useful. And finally, we use this integration and this knowledge to draw logical conclusions or devise new information, which means that we will use all this information and this knowledge to learn something new. And this allows us to generalize from things that we haven't seen in the past. Okay, so let me show you this picture and I'm going to ask you a question, which is look at this picture and tell me what is the man doing? Now, this is um, a sort of uh, example. It's a difficult case where a lot of reasoning skills have to be uh, utilized to be able to answer this question. So what will you do here? First of all, you're going to absorb the picture. And typically what we are trying to do is identify in the picture what's going on. So we will segment the units in the picture. So the units here are this pool, uh, the bear and the man, then we will consider multiple representations and interpretations. So what's happening? Is the bear trying to eat the man or is the bear with the man or is the man trying to get out of the water or into the water? Then we're going to put it all together, try to find out the best global interpretation, which in this case is the poor man is running for his life. Okay, so how do we currently solve this problem? Well, this is a, a task that people do a lot in uh, computer vision, and this is uh, called, uh, uh, you know, image-based question answering or visual question answering. And the usual solution is we're going to take a lot, a lot of data, like we're talking millions of images and questions and the right answers and we're going to collect this data and give it to a fat neural network and the fat neural network will try to land the right answer so in our example it may say the man is running for his life which is correct or it may give you the wrong answer which is he's going for a swim but irrespectively of the answer what you want to do is to sort of pick holes in this neural network and try to understand why it's coming up with the answer it is coming up with why is it obvious can we verify it somehow do we trust it and when things go wrong we want to find out what went wrong and where okay so what i'm going to try to convince you in this talk is that instead of having this big fat monolithic neural network we want to have like this different modules that each of them will be targeting a reasoning task and then we will have to learn somehow a reasoner and the reasoner will know which reasoning modules to switch on and off um, in different situations and uh, we will see how this plays out with movies okay so where do we come in and why do we care about movies well um aside from the fact that i'm saying to you that this is a good test bit for um uh, uh, testing reasoning theories. Uh, it seems uh, that movies are very much related with storytelling, and it seems also that storytelling is a primal um, it, uh, feature it, uh, for us humans. It's a human compulsion. This is Michael Dana. He's a Canadian composer, and he is telling us that we love films and storytelling, and it's a human compulsion, basically. So it's something that we very naturally do. We all watch movies, and we can also summarize them. And this is what I'm going to be telling you how to do this task of movie summarization. Uh, 
Okay, so what happens when we watch movies? There's a lot of reasoning that takes place. We uh, take in different things. There is the audio, there is uh, the speech, people talk to each other, there is the video, and we put it all together and we actually are able to identify who the main characters are, what they're doing, what is happening, who does what to whom and why. And now we take all of that and we want to be able to automate it. And I'm not kidding you, we'll see we can do something about it. Okay, aside from the fact that we want to study reasoning and that we think that movies are a good test, but there is a very practical reason why we want to study uh, movies and summarizing movies and uh, doing content analysis. So if you don't care about reasoning, you wish you care about the task itself, because it seems that there is a lot of streaming services nowadays. So the average household apparently has three streaming services. And by that, we mean Apple TV and Disney Plus and Netflix and Amazon. And it seems to be, well, people have done the studies and they have shown that 70% of the EU viewers, the users of these streaming services, cannot actually figure out what to watch. And it takes them more than 15 minutes to decide. So if you had better uh, movie content analysis software, we could help these, viewer, these, these view users. Okay, now uh, let me tell you a bit about the task. The task of movie summarization is very, very hard. So in the past, people have looked a text only, i.e. the screenplay, and they have done some analysis on the screenplay or on the video only without looking at the text and the speech at all by looking at superficial features of how, you know, the video goes, like whether you, you have a lot of movement or not movement and try to summarize these things. And there is a reason why people have not looked at everything because the task is really hard. Movies are very long. Um, usually two hours. If it's a, a big sort of Marvel movie, it's, you know, the average is three hours. They are complex stories. They are non-linear. And doing simple tricks like selecting the beginning and the end of the movie and stitching them together and saying that this is a summary will not work. This is a difficult problem. And it's compounded by the fact that we cannot do the five neural network approach where we have millions of labeled examples where humans annotate, you know, the, there aren't that many any movies, and even if we could annotate them, which we can't, it, it wouldn't be enough. So you have to be clever in terms of your modeling. Okay, so how we will solve the problem? Again, we will treat it as a reasoning task, and the first thing is we will segment the units and determine their correlations. And what does it mean here? Now, this is the problem. What does it mean segment the units in the movie? Well, we'll take a, we're going to take a high level view, which is we can segment very many things, the, the characters, uh, where things are taking place. But if we look at the movie as a whole, we have to chunk it. We have to identify units that make sense. And we'll do this using this turning point theory. And I will explain what this is. Then we will consider multiple representations. And in our case, this is going to be the text, the screenplay, the video, the audio. And we're going to put it all together, get the best interpretation. And we will do this by assuming underlying the underlying mo model uh, is represented as a graph. And again, I will show uh, how this looks like. And the hypothesis is that a good movie summary consists of scenes that are turning points in the story. And turning points it means really that, you know, some important events happen. Okay, this is a bird's eye view of what's gonna happen. We have the screenplay, we have the video, we have the audio, and we will use all this information to segment the movie into these turning points, main events in the story. And then we're gonna take these turning points and concatenate them, and this is our video summary. And I'll show you how we do this. But before I do that, I have to explain what turning points are. And it turns out that they're very old. They date back to Aristotle, who said that every story has three important events. And in his case, this is this triangle um, that has this, you know, beginning, middle and end. Uh, now, it turns out that this is not enough. So this lovely gentleman here, um, uh, Mr. Freytag, said, well, it's not really a triangle, it's a pyramid. So he took these events that Aristotle defined and turned them into a pyramid. So he, he put more things and it's a more fine-grained segmentation of the movie. And now we come in, so the turning points are really descendant of uh, Aristotle's and Freytag's classification of what it means to write a story. So the theory is that every story has these turning points that determine the progression of the plot. And these are used by screenwriters in Hollywood to actually make a good screenplay. So here are the five turning points we will try to automatically identify in the movies through the help of AI. And um, this is the opportunity the change of plans, 
point of no return, major setback and climax. And typically a lot of Hollywood movies, and I should say this is all uh, Hollywood, it's not Bollywood uh, or, you know, French alternative cinema, um, have these turning points. Um, so I'm going to explain these turning points using this uh, movie as an example. This is The Shining. Um, it's considered a classic horror film. Um, by Stanley Kubrick. I do recommend it. It's an amazing. It's considered a masterpiece. At the time that it was shown, it was not a masterpiece, but now we, we, we simply consider it a masterpiece. It's based on a book by Stephen King. And um, the first turning point in this movie uh, is the introductory event that occurs after we know what the setting is and what the main characters are. Um, then we will have the opportunity. And now uh, somebody from uh, the Turing will play the video for me. The only thing that can get a bit trying up here during the winter is uh, the tremendous sense of isolation. Well, that just happens to be exactly what I'm looking for. I'm, uh, I'm outlining a new writing project and uh, five months of peace is just what I want. Okay, shall we play it again once more because people might have missed it? The only thing that can get a bit trying up here during the winter is uh, the tremendous sense of isolation. Well, that just happens to be exactly what I'm looking for. I'm, uh, I'm outlining a new writing project and uh, five months of peace is just what I want. Okay, so this was the opportunity. Now the change of plans. So this is the event where the main goal of the story is defined. We figure out what the story is about. And from this point on, the action begins to increase. Can we play the second video now? Well, maybe things that happen leave other kind of traces behind. Not things that anyone can notice, but things that people who shine can see. Now, this is the change of plans. So from now on, things will start happening. And the third turning point is the point of no return. This is the event that pushes the main character to fully commit to their goal. And you will see in The Shining how this happens. Can we play the third video, please? Well, I dreamed that I, that I killed you with Danny. So uh, this is uh, Jack Nicholson, who is brilliant, saying, I had this dream that I was killing you and Danny, his wife and his child. Um, okay, so then uh, Jack Nicholson has this goal to kill everyone, well, his wife and the child, there's no one else there, but there is a major setback and this is, there's an event where everything falls apart, either temporarily or permanently. Can we play this uh, video, please? Here's Johnny! So, um, he's um, starting to um, chase them, but of course they resist. Um, and then we have the climax. Um, this is the final event of the main story, the moment of resolution, and the biggest spoiler. Um, can we play this? So this is revealed now that uh, Jack Nicholson, the main character, uh, is dead. Okay. So how are we going to model this and how are we going to identify these uh, turning points? Uh, we will break down the movie into scenes and we will represent the scene somehow using whatever your favorite neural network um, uh, is available. And this is the one module, the representation module. Once we've broken down, broken down the movie into scenes, uh, we will turn them into a graph using some similarity notion. Uh, so, uh, Scenes will be nodes in the graph and it will be a weighted graph where we indicate um, how, how similar are the different scenes. How will we compute the similarity? Well, we're going to take the text into account we're going to, and also the video and the audio. So scenes are going to be similar if they sound or look the same. 
So we're turning this movie into this big graph. This graph will have many connections. A lot of them will be useless or not useless exactly, but not very informative. So we will make it a bit sparser. So we're going to get rid of some of the connections. Usually a screenplay will have maybe 200 or 300 scenes. So this is a big graph. Um, we're going to get rid of some of the neighbors and then we have a representation of the movie. So this graph tells us which scenes are connected which, with what other scenes. And so now we will have the representation of the scenes as a linear sequence and the representations of scenes as a graph. We will take those two together and our task is to predict these turning points where in the movie, for example, will be an opportunity or the climax or, you know, where it will Jack Nicholson die. Um, and it's important that we are doing it on a higher level. We don't know anything about the characters at this point. And we are assuming that these turning points appear in every movie. So this is why we are giving this model some generalization. Okay. So um, let me show you some results here. The only thing I want you to focus on is the great gray bar chart. The gray tells us how good is the gold standard. So how good is the like, gold truth um, at identifying humans, basically, at, at, at identifying these turning points. The blue or light blue is um, uh, our model and the orange is the baseline. I can answer questions about the baseline, but the important thing is to see our model compared with the humans. And the first thing you notice is a per turning point, that it's relatively okay at identifying the first turning point. This is the opportunity, doing very well at identifying the change of plans, not so well at identifying the point of no return where, you know, the character is committed to, to, to their goal. Um, okay at identifying the major setback and climax where things you know get out of control is rather difficult for the model and overall there is a five percent difference so there's a lot of work to do to uh, reach the upper bound which is how humans how well do humans identify these turning points now what do these graphs mean remember in the beginning i said you know if we have a model that breaks things down and is more interpretable we need to be able to use this model to figure out what it means for this graph to represent a movie in our case so every movie is represented as a graph and uh, in this picture here i'm showing you how connected is a turning point which is represented by scenes to all the other turning points in the movie and so we can see differences depending on the genre of the movie. If you have actions or comedies, we see high connectivity. The stories are more coherent. You see, if you see the um, y-axis here, we have like 0 0.8 connectivity. So every turning point is connected to every other turning point. Um, there isn't a lot of change in, in you know, um, how characters interact. If we look at thrillers or dramas, there is low connectivity which indicates that the stories are more complex and, you know, which makes sense for a thriller. We don't want to know who the killer is. We start by wanting to find out. So it makes sense for the stories to be more disconnected. Let me show you an example here. These are uh, bird's eye view graphs for different movies. These are comedies and action movies, and you see good connectivity. There is connections between turning points, i.e. connections between events and contrast this between dramas and thrillers. For example, let's look at American Beauty. This is a movie that is told in a non-linear fashion and you see that the graphs here are rather disconnected, um, which makes sense. So we can understand what the model is doing and we see that these graphs make sense overall. Okay, so um, this is my penultimate slide. Um, so I've talked about movie summarization uh, via this turning point identification. I said that it's a good idea to represent the movies as graphs and I've also shown you that these graphs are interpretable, so the model connections between scenes. And I want to finish by showing you the uh, summary that the model created on The Shining. So if you could just play, um, this is my last video. You do too, no, no, come on, tell me. Don't want to. Please. No. You know, Doc, when something happens, it can leave a trace of itself behind. Say, like, if someone burns toast. Well, 
maybe things that happen leave other kind of traces behind. Not things that anyone can notice, but things that people who shine can see. Thank you very much, Morella, for that absolutely fascinating um, discussion of your work. A couple of questions that have come in from the audience um, that we'll go to now. First question is from Anonymous. Can you elaborate on the pairwise similarity calculations between scenes in the graph before you convert it into a sparse graph? Okay, that's it. I don't know if Morella can hear. Morella, can you hear me? Okay, I'm asking you some questions from the audience just now. I think we're just waiting on Morella to be able to hear me through um, I can. Zoom. I can. Repeat the question. Okay, we've got a question through from the audience. Um, can you elaborate on the pairwise similarity calculations between scenes in the graph before you convert it into a sparse graph? Yes. Uh, thank you for this question. Okay, so we need to actually have some idea of how the different scenes connect to each other. And because we're sparsifying it, we do not want to miss out on scenes that are important. So the similarity tells us, are these scenes similar? Basically, can we get rid of some and represent the, you know, one that is more general and that encompasses all the other scenes? Because, of course, we don't know what's happening, really. I mean, the model does not know like a human would. Uh, we need a heuristic to say, okay, these scenes talk about the same thing, so pick one scene as opposed to all of them. And so how do we measure similarity? It's, it, and this was kind of difficult because you have the textual similarity, which is not very useful in the case of movies. And it's not very useful in the case of movies because there's a lot, they always talk. Um, however, computer vision and the audio are very, very, very useful in this case. Computer vision because it will tell you what the action is. So if we have two characters talking in a room, it's going to look different than a person, you know, climbing up, climbing up a, a hill like a Spider-Man and, and trying to do things like that. So the, it looks different. But also the audio is a very important cue and I did not go into the details as to, you know, which information is most important. But uh, audio matters a lot. By audio, I do not mean uh, speech, it's all the things that are in movies like explosions, banks, uh, music, all of these give important cues and of course scenes that have different music do tell you different things. Um, that's why we use similarity and of course it's a heuristic, it's not, uh, you know, none of this is accurate. We are simulating human understanding, we are not, uh, you know, doing it as a human would do. That probably brings us on quite nicely to an, a question that's come through from Topi Omatola. Do the turning point theory, uh, does the turning point theory work across movies from different cultures, for instance, Hollywood, Bollywood, Nollywood, etc.? Yes, um, so they say that it works. Now, we have not tested it on Bollywood or on, you know, alternative movies. There are some movies nowadays, you know, that... that Probably they don't, or Nick Nolan's movies, like, you know, if you take Memento, where it starts backwards, 
it would fail because they go outside the mold. But more or less, we have been very surprised. We have even tested it in movies from the 30s. Um, and it sort of holds water in the sense that, you know, maybe you won't find all the turning points, but definitely when you're telling a story, you have these events. And to the extent that the model learns to recognize these events, even if we don't call them turning points, the theories and some would, uh, you know, verified by our experiments that you will find them. Um, of course, there is movies that do not prescribe to this, and these are usually different. But uh, yeah, we cannot hope that the model will find everything or will do a good job at everything. This is uh, an assumption we're making. I'm going to ask you, there, there's quite a few questions here, but I've just got time for one final one. Um, Morel, this is from Adrian Powell. Um, he says, great presentation, thanks. Um, a graph inference problem? I don't think I understand the reasoning angle. Oh, I see. Well, he's right. <laughs> he says, well, okay, you, you, you came up with everything about the, the reasoning and the graphs, and now you have sort of reduced everything to a graph reasoning problem. Yes, you're right. So we are doing one little bit. I mean, in theory, you would have many graphs doing different things, and then you would have a mega graph um, coordinating the little subgraphs, but we are not yet there yet. And this is, a, <laughs> I'm glad people were paying attention. Um, yes. Uh, that's it. That's me. I'll stop sharing now, yeah? Thank you very much, Morel. And thank, thank you, everybody, you. for, for sending questions. Lots of questions here, Morella. Perhaps um, get in touch with I'll her look, directly. I'll look, yeah, Definitely. I'll get in touch. Thank you. Amazing. So thank you very much, Morella. And um, we're now going to move on to our final um, presentation for this Spotlight Talk session. And um, for anyone who's been paying attention, we are running over a little bit, but do stick with us for our final one, um, because we've got a, another brilliant presentation from... Um, real life research and action, looking at some really interesting areas um, that I think everyone's quite interested in how AI is being applied to. So our final presentation is going to be from Professor Philip Torr. He's a professor in computer vision and machine learning at Oxford Brookes University. He's just getting set up now and um, getting ready to come in and discuss with us. And um, just so that you know, um, after this session, we're actually going to go for a break on this stage. Um, there's content going on all the time though, I'm sure you're very uh, aware of that from the Hop-In platform. Um, so don't don't think that there's nothing going on. There's lots of different other stages to explore. Um, but after this one, um, after Philip's uh, presentation, <clears throat> we're not gonna be back on till two um, with our next session. So we're just waiting on um, the, the tech to get all set up, the joys of doing a conference both virtual and in person. We're just getting our final, um, final presentation all set up for you guys. Of course, I've also been noticing there's lots going on on Twitter as well, by the way. So if you're the sort of person to be tweeting away, I'm sure the, the team at the Alan Turing Institute would love to hear what have been some of your favorite things from today, what some of the comments you have on some of the presentations, any extra questions you still have unanswered. Perhaps you disagree with some of the things that have been said by some of the speakers. Um, do let the, the team know. I mean, this is all about discussion, right? These conferences are here, not just for you know everybody to be lectured at, but more to try and invite collaboration and discussion and discourse around these various topics that surround AI and data science, both in the UK and of course around the world. So do get involved, whether it's on Twitter, whether it's in chat here on Hopin, or of course um, getting in touch and getting involved with the Alan Turing Institute after the conference. They've got many different programs going on for all different types of uh, researchers at all different stages. Um, and of course, people who are not primary researchers, but work in various different other areas that are linked uh, to this technology and how it's used in society. Um, and you know, I, I know that the Institute are very keen to make sure that there's lots of different um, link-ins and connections that are being made from various different people. Um, as I said, also lots of different stages on today. We've got everything from public policy through to the way science is communicated. Um, and also we've got a lot of different content going on tomorrow, both on this stage and across the others. We've got sessions on PhDs and how making the most out of it. Um, we've got sessions specifically on neuroscience. And tomorrow, of course, we've got a whole session um, all about the sort of global concern consortium that's looking at AI and how we should be thinking about standards, ethics, and so on and so forth. So lots of different topics, and hopefully you've been able to, to already get involved and uh, take part in a lot of different discussions that are happening today. Also workshops, um, you would have heard Dustin mention at the start of this session, um, where you're going to get a little bit more in depth, a bit more technical detail around some of these projects and others um, that the Turing, of course, are supporting and wanting everybody to get involved with um, today. 
So hopefully we're, we're almost ready with Philip. We're ready for Philip. Amazing. Okay, so bringing on stage, as I said before, Professor Philip Torr, Professor in Computer Vision and Machine Learning at Oxford Brookes University. Philip, take it away. In one second. <laughs> Um, at Microsoft Research, and then I went to Oxford Brooks, and now um, for the past sort of 10 years I've been at Oxford uh, University. And um, uh, I've got a big uh, group that works on uh, computer vision, uh, and so um, we have lots of collaborations with different companies, so I'm going to talk about a few of the applications of computer vision but then i'm also going to talk about some of the interesting open problems um with uh machine learning as applied to computer vision so what's computer vision i hear you uh, cry well it's a uh, an interesting discipline uh that touches on many other disciplines in fact mirella's talk was really great because in the most general uh case you might say it's um uh, somehow a description of the scene. So it could be a verbal description or it could be uh, some sort of uh, identification of salient objects or action recognition. Um, and uh, it's uh, very interesting because uh, it relates to uh, psychophysics, to robotics, um, to people, uh, linguists. So um, it's a great enterprise. And uh, there's been quite a few um, you know, initially, so I've worked in computer vision for the past sort of 30 years or so. And um, initially, people tried to look at the brain for uh, for inspiration as to how these things uh, work. Uh, although that's hard in itself, because nobody really knows how the brain works. Um, then the 90s saw a real flourishing of, uh, of uh, methods to understand the geometry of the scene, 3D reconstruction. So I was kind of involved in that. Um, and then the 2000s saw a, a reawakening of uh, interest in object recognition. And um, at the time, people would try and you know, make edge detectors or other types of handcrafted features um, where they try and extract information for the image and then use those handcrafted features to, um, to try and uh, recognize objects. And actually, I mean, it was quite uh, exciting because it was in my field of computer vision that deep networks initially cut their teeth. Um, so there was um, a big, uh, a big uh, uh, data set collected called ImageNet, which was this huge challenge on object recognition. Um, it had uh, lots and lots of uh, people had labeled particular objects in the image, and the uh, task was for a, a machine to try and classify those objects. And um, previously, people had used um, these handcrafted features, but then um, in 2012, um, it was shown that deep learning, uh, which would automatically um, learn to uh, extract representations and um, uh, uh, features uh, from the images, would actually, this um, actually showed that deep learning um, far surpassed any of the previous methods, and it was much better to try and learn these features. And it was a really fortuitous combination at that point, because um, uh, this type of um, deep learning architecture uh, could make use of GPUs, which had seen an enormous progress because of the interest in games. And also um, the rise of the internet meant there was lots of data and uh, a nice combination with um, um, the internet allowed you to get labels for this data as well. So, so anyway, what happened was that uh, many fields, including the field of computer vision, were revolutionized by deep learning. Um, and uh, yeah, there are lots of applications of um, of uh, computer vision which have benefited from this. So I'll talk briefly about three that uh, I've been involved with, and then I'll talk about some um, interesting problems or flaws. So um, I uh, span out my first company, which was Oxite, and one of the things I was really interested in was actually trying to use computer vision technologies to help the partially sighted. And so um, there are a huge number of people with um, sight problems worldwide, and you might have all sorts of uh, degenerative problems that uh, come up. Um, and that you might also have many people who are legally blind who have um, some sort of residual uh, vision. So um, I was really interested in trying to use computer vision technologies to um, help people with like some of the major issues they face, like uh, 
anything from facial uh, recognition to independent navigation or reading. Um, and obviously, because computer vision can generate either verbal descriptions or depth maps from uh, images automatically, um, it could probably be used to help partially sighted. So we um, pioneered work in uh, uh, wearable augmented reality glasses that would provide additional information to help the partially sighted. So that's um, that's one application. Um, also, recently, I've been interested in using computer vision um, to automatically work out um, the size and shape of people. Uh, this uh, there's a huge interest in uh, buying. Uh, uh, things online, especially accelerated by COVID, but there's a huge problem with returns. And often these returns in clothing are caused by either poor fit or people not being able to visualize the try on. So um, again, we've been using deep learning and uh, uh, computer vision techniques. So allow um, people to uh, work out their sizes on their smartphones. And so that you could uh, perhaps display um, uh, the clothes on you and also get the correct fit, hopefully reducing returns. Um, and then also uh, I've been involved in another company, 5AI, from its um, outset. And initially we started off um, uh, uh, with the problem of uh, autonomous vehicles. And it's quite interesting when you've got autonomous vehicles because um, uh, for me it was a joy because um, they require uh, and really motivate the use of uh, sensors and visual systems to understand the world and to navigate. Um, but as we progressed, our company also pitched much more towards trying to understand the failure cases of these, because the failure cases for autonomous cars, you know, are very it can be very serious. Um, uh, people um, uh, dying, which you know is is a very uh, bad option. So understanding the robustness of these systems and where they go wrong actually um, through my experience in these companies actually really motivated me to try and understand failure cases for deep learning because this um, especially when these things even though there's only a small chance of them going wrong if these things go wrong and they kill people this is obviously an awful consequence so um and and it's kind of interesting actually there was a in a in a 2019 um uh, Tencent Security Lab actually were able to just um, deploy little markers on the road that could make um, a Tesla car that were in a certain particular configuration. It could make a, a Tesla car veer off into a different lane, um, which you know seems like a highly undesirable behaviour. So. Um, as I said, deep learning uh, really came and swept um, you know, computer vision by storm. And very often um, people would now learn um, classifiers, something that would take an input image and um, hopefully return the classification pig for this input image. And it seemed to work really well. Um, you know, the performance rates went up massively um, until um, but they have some strange behaviors which are very uh, counterintuitive to humans. So um, what you can do is you can find a certain pattern of noise. Um, this has just uh, been slightly magnified, but actually the noise pattern itself would be imperceptible to a human. And you can add it to the image. And um, very often you can cause arbitrary changes in the uh, in the classification. So this image here has had that noise pattern added to it. And the classifier now goes from it being pig to airliner. And um, this was uh, especially interesting for me because it's in uh, computer vision, which is what I work on, image understanding. But actually this instability to very small patterns of noise applies to all deep, network, deep networks and applies across a range of domains. So it's, um, you know, a puzzling thing. And you might say, well, how likely is this pattern of noise? But even if it only had a small chance of happening, if you're, say, um, in an autonomous car and you're running millions of miles and it causes, um, you know, a person who's walking in front of you to be misclassified as uh, just the road, for instance, then actually the consequences could be fatal. And it reminds me um, of uh, the Apollo 13 uh, project, which, um, actually uh, ran into trouble because of something called gimbal lock, which is a very rare um, 
occurrence for the uh, navigation system. So um, as I saw this phenomenon, I've become uh, fascinated with why, why um, these deep networks have this uh, um, somehow this difference to um, to humans. And so the rest of the talk, I'm just going to talk a little bit about um, these surprising fragilities of deep learning systems. Partly also, I think it's a useful um, lesson to learn as we start to um, automate more of society to actually understand where these things can go wrong and actually really be aware that they have potential biases or problems, which um, uh, means we should always um, be guarding against those in the future. Um, and, and again, this is, uh, you know, uh, an image and this here would be um, the original image, some classification. And again, you can create a noise pattern that just outputs garbage. So instead of having the road here, it's just all of these colours correspond to just arbitrary classes. Um, so what's happening when you do this is, uh, um, you know, if you imagine you've got the classification boundary, and you've got some small amounts of noise, what you're doing is you're shifting your data point somehow across the boundary. So, um, and if, it, if this is like an imperceptible noise, then this boundary is probably not very good. You probably wanted the boundary to be a bit further away. So you could imagine all of these are imperceptible noises, which you add to this point here. And actually, you probably say all of these guys should also take the same classification. And we'll come back to that a bit later when we look at how people defend against these sorts of um, uh, problems. And it's kind of worse because you might think that um, uh, these um, noise patterns, maybe they're just like a freak of, you know, the particular network we use to tra train on, um, on that uh, task. But actually, um, somehow you can design some types of patterns which can uh, actually fool many different types of networks so this again is um you know a worrying thing because it indicates there's something fundamental that we're missing or not understanding um people have also broadened the um uh, uh definition of adversarial examples so rather than saying um it's something that's indistinguishable to a human you might say that actually it's something that's obvious to a human is a mistake, but um, but for uh, uh, you know the machine's obviously making a mistake in some way, which is against what we would call common sense. So um, as an example of that, um, you might, for instance, um, have uh, just say here we've got these um, images almost look the same, but they've just been shifted by one or two pixels. And what's happening is now the classification goes wrong for these. And it's interesting because um, that indicates here a, a kind of difference with the machine in that here it's not been, um, it's not been uh, invariant to one pixel shifts, but it can actually, um, you know, some distortions it finds relatively easy, which we might find hard. For instance, um, these images it classifies correctly, even though there's a huge amount of noise in it. So it looks, you know, understanding the difference between how machines make um, decisions and how humans make decisions is super important, especially if they're going to be making decisions about our lives. And what's nice here is, say, with these visual examples, is you can see the differences very clearly. Um, Again, in computer vision, uh, people have found that, um, as I say, rotations um, and translations can often just arbitrarily change your um, your uh, classification. You might be able to find like a, a slight rotation that can just um, give you a very different uh, classification. So that's that's worrying, and so that's why. Um, part of like uh, understanding how to defend against these is related to a very old concept in computer vision, which is the study of invariances. So how do you make your classification system invariant to certain types of transformation? Um, and, you know, I guess an open question is even what those space of what that space of transformation should be. Um, people also found that these um, these uh, 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 attacks could also occur if you just black out certain parts of the image. Again, you can start to make the uh, 
the uh, classification arbitrarily change. And of course, you can imagine, you know, this is for visual data, so you can see it very clearly. But for any other data where you've got maybe a corrupted element of your input, you might end up with some, um, you know, very nonsensical results. So again, it's a, it's a general problem. Uh, and actually, you can even create these physically. So people were putting on um, special types of sunglasses and arbitrarily um, changing the uh, result of uh, face recognition systems, which, you know, as face recognition systems are being deployed more and more by law enforcement um, uh, authorities, is, is, is kind of worrying because um, they're being deployed, but these systems are still fundamentally very fragile, and they might even also suffer from bias due to race or uh, or other types of things. So, so super important to understand. And um, these are now much more perceptible, but you might just change the shadowing or um, the colouring of the images, and again, it will um, you know rapidly uh, uh, change your classification. So, so this is this is, again is kind of not very desirable. Um, there's another thing as well, which um, uh, this kind of, uh, uh, so for instance, here you might change the image color a little bit and you get a different, um, a different type of classification. And this shows that often um, these deep networks are picking up spurious correlations. So they're very good at um, matching patterns, but actually the pattern that they match will often be something that you might classify as um, a very simple pattern. So they'll have a, like a simplicity bias and they might pick up um, some feature which as humans, we probably would disregard and they might actually um, pick up this spurious correlation. So I can kind of sketch out an example of where this might be the case. So supposing I had a world in which um, I collect a huge data set of, um, of uh, red post boxes and I'm not very clever in the way that I um, uh, collect this data set. So I want to train a neural network to classify post boxes. So what I do is I have to have positive and negative examples. So I get a whole load of red post boxes and then maybe I get negative examples which are just other elements of a street scene. But the problem is that um, if that, uh, supposing those elements of the street scene don't include um, things which are also red, then the neural network might just pick up that say, all that you need to classify a post box would be that one pixel needs to be red. In which case, um, the moment you show it's a red car, it might also say it's a post box. So that's a that's an example of how um, deep networks could pick up spurious correlations, and uh, that might also lead to these types of attacks. So kind of um, kind of an important problem to be able to address and to understand. And this might again come into problems uh, when you have like a. a uh, diversity of people's races or ages or something like that. You, you have to be very careful to avoid these types of spurious correlations. So um, very quickly, um, I'll just sketch out how some people are trying to, and including my group, we work on this, but um, some of the common techniques for trying to um, guard against these uh, adversarial uh, or these um, types of uh, uh, attacks or, or incorrect uh, lack of invariances. Um, and then at the end, I'm also going to just say um, uh, just where the open problems are, a few of what I see as the open problems. So um, one idea, so remember I said that um, somehow uh, we might have a space where we think that, um, oh yeah, okay, <laughs> super quick then. Um, uh, one um, idea might be to, um, uh, to do what's called adversarial training, where I look for the worst case um, for one of these attacks, I add in a point and then I retrain and that changes the transformation barrier. Another type of um, training might be to add, uh, to take a majority vote um, around this, uh, which leads to a smooth classification boundary and that's called randomized smoothing. Um, I won't go too much into that. Another a type of approach is called network verification, which basically um, formulates this as an optimization problem and says, given um, this uh, boundary, can I detect a counterexample? And you can formulate that as an optimization uh, problem. Uh, and then I guess finally, I'd probably just say um, one of the uh, most important things as well, which is um, 
uh, a very open problem is related to this. How can we give uncertainty estimates for any particular classification that we're going to make? And again, this is um, something my group and many other groups are working on, but um, it's kind of uh, difficult because somehow um, when you're um, when you're making these uncertainty estimates, you need to um, uh, have an idea of what perceptual distance is. Like when I've got two images, how closely are they in some sort of semantic space? That's an open problem. Um, another open problem is what even should be the space of transformations that um, we want to be able to be robust against is. I mean, we can imagine it's going to be rotations and small translations, but what else? Um, so uh, I guess I guess here's a bunch of open questions. The space of transformations, um, uh, also the perceptual distance between different types of images, and how should we even estimate uncertainty? And um, you know, can we get any inspiration from how humans estimate uncertainty. So anyway, that was a brief whirlwind of like some of the problems that uh, might come up from uh, from deep learning and why you should be a little bit wary of it. Thank you very much, Philip, for that um, fascinating uh, deep dive and, and so many brilliant examples there to really bring to life what you're talking about. We've got quite a few questions here, but we're, we're running close to time. So I'm just going to pick one um, from our list of audience questions. I'm going to pick this one from Mark Richley. How much work is being done fortifying NNs versus finding an alternative solution to NNs for image classification? Would an alternative be considered seriously? I think so. Actually, that's a great question because um, well, you know, in my time in uh, computer vision, different types of machine learning paradigms, random forest or boosting, uh, Ada boost, came and went. I probably think deep learning is here to stay because um, the results are really good. But I wouldn't rule out that there might be another paradigm shift at some point in the future. And, I, you know, one of the points I was making is that the reason deep learning, for instance, in its convolutional form became so popular was due to the rise of GPUs and the architectures as it exists. You can imagine if similar types of architectural developments occur in the future, then there might be another paradigm. Um, so, yeah, maybe that's part of the question, but it's, yeah, there's, there's, there's a lot, it's, it's a really good question because there are actually lots of aspects that you could, um, or ways you could look at the answer to that. And of course, I mean, you finished your talk with a big list of questions. I think that's the point, right? There's still lots to be answered in many different yeah, ways. Yeah, I would say, you know, it's really interesting. I think there's been a lot of hype about um, deep learning, but we're still like a snapshot in time. And, you know, things are progressing very quickly. Amazing. Philip, thank you so much uh, for joining us uh, today to tell us all about your work in, um, in, in AI and in your models that you've shared with us um, this afternoon. We're now going to head to break on this stage. Um, we're going to be away until two o'clock for our next session. Um, as I said earlier, there's obviously lots of content in other stages that will still be going on at various times. So if you've uh, already got your lunch or you want to sit and, and eat while you watch, there's plenty there. Um, but if you're just wanting to come back and watch what's going on in the in the lab stage, we'll be back at two for our next session. So until then, um, we'll say goodbye and we'll see you back in an hour and a half. Thanks very much.